Are you guys ready to go into the Word of God together? Yeah. All right, let, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll spend some time in the Word of God. Let's pray. Lord, as we come together, we pray that you bless our time, that our time in Scripture is, strengthens our experience with you. Lord, we don't just desire to know the Bible as theory, but we want to apply it to our lives. So, Lord, guide us and lead us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The title of today's message is, Why the Written Word of God Matters. And I want to first start off with uh, this, this idea. Um, real quick, are my slides showing up uh, up there? Or just, just wanted to, because there's some uh, images that I want to share with you all. I want to ask you a question. What kind of conversations do you typically have with people? Because we are humans, because we are, you know, we're all different ages and different uh, backgrounds, we all have different types of relationships. Have you ever had a relationship with someone that is very, like, superficial because you don't have the time to develop a relationship that is deeper, right? Have you ever met someone at your workplace, at your job, and you, you start to talk about the weather because you don't really have anything else in common, you know? You don't have time to really build a relationship with people. And the reality is that it's very difficult to have deep relationships with many people, right? It's hard to, to develop a relationship with someone that is deep. We typically stay with uh, relationships that are superficial because we are, we're busy, we get caught up with things, but you start to really uh, value those family relationships that you can start a conversation and there's inside jokes without really trying hard. You get what I'm saying? Well, you know, it, I, I started to think about that, um, think about us for our messages. How do you know about God or do you know him personally? The question that I have for you this morning is, is Jesus an acquaintance or is he a friend? You may know about someone. I know about Josh Allen, the quarterback, but do I know him as a person? No, right? So the question is, do you know about Jesus, the person, about him, or do you know him personally on a heart-to-heart -heart level? The definition of an acquaintance is a person's knowledge or experience of something. A friend is a person whom one knows and with one whom has a bond of mutual affection. We need to understand that God desires to communicate with us. Because God loves us, he communicates with us. You can't say to someone, I love you, and not be in communication with that someone. It's a paradox. So people call your parents, right? Isn't that saying, call your mom? <laughs> we need to understand that because God cares about us, he communicates with us, and that is what the written word of God is. That's what the Bible is. It's God communicating with you and me. But sometimes we treat God like an ATM machine, where we try to just get something from God, right? We put on our debit card, we put in some um, buttons, press some buttons, and then get some cash out. We do that with God. We tend to look for God when we want something, right? Have you ever had your closest moments with God when you are in crisis? Where you're constantly praying, when you're constantly going to the word of God because you're in crisis, you need something. But does God want to be treated like an ATM? When you only need them, you just go and you withdraw something. And it's interesting because, you know, we, you know, we, we need to understand that God cares to communicate with us and he is available. Do look for God when you need him. But that's not just all of the relationship that God desires to have with us. When you read in Job chapter 12, turn in your Bibles to Job chapter 12. It will be on the slides for your um, convenience. But please follow along in your notes in your own Bible. 
in Job chapter 12, Job is going to about to communicate with us that Job is down and out. He's lost his family. He's lost his wealth. He's now losing his own health. And he's, you know, in the, in, in the uh, you know, type of position where he's just observing what's happened. And you either grow closer to God through crisis or you grow further from him. And it's interesting because the enemy will try to convince you that when you are hurting to go away from God. When I've gone through something traumatic in my life, people have checked in who check in with me and say, how is your relationship with God, with God going? Because typically when we're hurting, some, some of us go away like a wounded animal, right? Not wanting to be helped. In John, and in Job chapter 12, this is what Job says. He says, but ask the beasts and they will teach you the birds of the heavens, and they will tell you, or the bushes of the earth, and they will teach you, and the fish of the sea will declare to you, who among all these does not know that the, that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Here we find the text that Job is looking to nature and saying, well, if the Lord is taking care of the animals out there in the wilderness. If the Lord is taking care of the beasts, of the, the fish, they will tell you that God is the one providing for them. So he's communicating to you and me that if the animals know this, how much more should we? Knowing that God is the one that provides for us, that God is the one there for you and me. We need to realize in our lives that, you know, the enemy will only want to accuse you and bring you down. When you find in, when you find in, in the book of Job, when you study the book of Job, Satan's accusation against Job is Job only loves God because Job has, his life is easy. That Job is only faithful to God because Look, he has a bunch of children. He has a ton of land. He has all these animals. Everything's going good for, for Job. So, of course, he's going to love God. But we see here in the text is that, that we need to understand that Satan only accuses. He never flatters you. When you start to wrestle with decisions in your life, and you know that God is leading you this way, but you know ever so slightly, you're like, well, what if I go this way? Maybe God won't endorse it, but... It will turn out better. We need to understand that when the, when the enemy tries to uh, f uh, f flirt with you to make you go a certain direction, he never has your best interest in mind. You need to understand that God's way is not just random. It's for your benefit. We need to understand in our lives that, that this image here that I'm showing to you all is, is really interesting because... God is not a puppet master. This image here is, is a type of, called, of theology, if you're really into theology or predestination, that God creates the, the really bad things in your life then to bring you to Jesus. But I am not of that persuasion. As Seventh-day Adventists, we do not subscribe to this theology because we realize in the great controversy that that sin and pain and suffering is not a product of God, but it's a product of sin manifested in the person of Satan and sometimes our own decisions, right? We get ourselves into trouble. So what we need to understand is that God can take your mess and make it your message. Like, don't automatically disqualify yourself from being a, a, a disciple of Jesus because your life has been messy. Typically, churches highlight the people who have, you know, behind the scenes, maybe they're, 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 behind the scenes their lives are broken, but before everyone else, their lives look great. But we need to understand that each one of us have certain messes in our life, and God works in the midst of our mess. That we can't disqualify ourselves because our lives aren't perfect, but rather give your mess to God, and God will take your mess and make it a message. 
Job realizes that if God takes care of nature out there, how much more will he take care of you? We need to understand that God takes care of nature and he will take care of you. I've been living out here in western New York for several years now, and I really enjoy the four seasons that we encounter. Um, in the southwest where I originally grew up, it's in, specifically in Arizona where my parents are at, it just tends to be like two seasons, 115 degrees and 80 degrees, just like that. But here in New York, I'm able to uh, see the four seasons, and uh, I, every year, the pastors in our conference have a pastor's retreat, and we go to the Adirondacks. This specific, well, I want to give you a little statistics about the Adirondacks. The Adirondacks is our 5,000 square miles of undeveloped land. The top of these mountains, the, 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 the highest elevation of these mountains is 5,300 feet. 200 lakes surround the Adirondack Mountains. And I didn't know this, but the Hudson River originates from the Adirondacks. So if you have any, any connection to New York City. You know, last year, my, uh, my wife and I went to this, this uh, mountain called the White Face Mountain. And we wanted to, to go to the top of it. And there's two ways to go to the top of it. One is, you see this trail on the right side of your screen, on the, in the middle, you can like hike that. But I'm not much of a hiker. That is not my thing, okay? So little do you know, on, on this portion, I'm going to try to reach over here, this portion up there, there's a, an elevator. Uh, and the elevator, that's my type of transportation. You go in there and you go up the mountain, but part of that experience is you, the, the, the people who made this, this park this uh, made this accessible, um, allows you, they, they, they carved 424 feet inside the mountain, okay? So you're walking into this mountain, and if you've ever been into a mountain, you see the veins of water that are going through the mountain that are just porous, right? And, and you start to walk in there, and my sons are still learning to walk, and they're like slipping, they're, they're, they're tripping over things, and you start to see it's dark in there, and it gets really chilly, right? You're walking in this mountain, and little, little by little, you realize how tiny you are compared to that stone of a mountain. You start to notice that if there were to be some catastrophic failure of the tunnel, you will be squished like a gnat, right? It will be done and over with. But you walk through it, and I was one, as I was walking through it, I was just, I, I realized how tiny I am. And even how tiny this mountain is in comparison to God, right? That even God is bigger than this stone, white-faced mountain. And th this is the top of the mountain with my kids and my wife. And you just see this landscape, and you see the kind of the curvature of the world, where you see, where you walk out there, and you go out, and all you see is how tiny you are, you know? And, and, and this reminds me that if God created the whole world, and I'm so tiny— he still cares about me as much as he cares about all of creation. We need to understand as believers that we have dignity in the eyes of God. That we're not just a number. We're not just a pebble. We're not just a speck. But we are created in his image. And because of that, we have value. And the, and, and, and the, and the message of nature reminds us of that. But we need to understand that the, 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 in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, the scripture says, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Here the text is saying, look how beautiful nature is, but you can't even imagine what God has prepared for us when he returns. But when, the Lord can use nature to communicate to us, but he also uses his written word to talk to us, to communicate with us. John 5, 39 says, The scriptures that bear witness about me, 
We'll start there with that little snippet, and I want to explain. By John chapter 5, we are introduced to Jesus speaking with the religious elites of his time. We need to understand that Jesus, when he was walking in this earth, he, uh, found, he was talking to people. And when people find out, find out you're a religious leader, things, dynamics can get a little interesting. And I've mentioned this before. When I tell people I'm a pastor, they, tell, they start to tell me that they pray. And I'm like, oh, that's good that you pray. You know, people bring up religious things. And when Jesus, Jesus was walking and talking, people started to notice that Jesus was very, uh, he could really challenge the religious elite and bring closer to those that are frail in their walk with God. And what we find here in the text is that Jesus is saying that the scriptures that the Pharisees love testify about Jesus. And he's saying something that, it, that, that, that can challenge us is you can read scripture and miss Jesus. There's a story of an Adventist church doing an evangelistic series. They're doing the Daniel Revelation series. They, they, they advertised throughout the, 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 the community, and as they communicated with people, people started to show up. And if you've ever been part of an evangelistic series, when you see a new person inside the building, you're like, all right, it's a touchdown, right? And this pastor saw this couple come to church, and he was like, oh, they came today. The next day they came. The next day they came. And Eventually, one day they missed on a Sunday. And, and, and the pastor was like, oh boy. If you've ever been part of an evangelistic campaign, you can relate to what I'm saying. Amen. The next day, on Monday, that couple returned and the pastor was like, praise the Lord, right? He was happy. And so that afterwards, on that Monday night, the pastor went to the, 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 the couple and said, look, I'm so glad you're here. You know, we pray that this, this evangelistic series has been a blessing to you. And they're like, yeah, it is. And, and, and she said this. She's like, they said, the couple said this. They said, yesterday we missed out because the other church has Jesus, but we came back today because you guys have the truth. You guys get the, 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 the cognitive dissonance? That there, you can know about truth but still miss Jesus. And this is what Jesus is saying here to the Pharisees, that all of Scripture points to Christ. If you lose sight of Christ in your theology, your theology is off the mark. From Genesis to Revelation, Christ is found in Scripture. We need to understand that the prime, the prime motive for Scripture is for us to meet the person of Christ. So when you read Scripture, don't just look for random factoids, but rather look for the person of Christ. When I go to have my devotions, I don't think to myself, I have an undergraduate in theology, a master's in theology. You know, what else can I learn? Blah, blah, blah. I need to look for Christ and my own walk with the Lord via his word. The written word of God matters because Jesus matters, church. Let's not get caught up with religiosity, but rather point people to Christ and Christ leads us to the Sabbath. Christ leads us to the, to the proper understanding of the second coming. Christ does not take away doctrine. Christ put, puts doctrine in its correct place. But sometimes we can be like Pharisees and fall under the, 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 the idea that Jesus is a uh, he is a threat to our religious experience. But because I follow Jesus, I follow the written word of God. And over the last couple of, of weeks as your pastor, the messages here that we've been sharing with you all is to strengthen your walk with Christ. It's not just to flatter your ears, but it's to lead you to Jesus. John chapter 6, verse 63 says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. We find here that the text is bringing us to our minds that the written word of God along, alongside the spirit of God brings the word, the word of God alive. 
Don't go to the Bible just so you can fight with other people who worship differently than you. Go to the Bible to meet Jesus. And when you meet Jesus, you've made a commitment to him. And because you're committed to him, you're not limited by tradition. You're not limited by religious uh, assumptions. But you follow Jesus wherever he goes. One of, the open, one of the songs that we sing together is the song, Is He Worthy? Or, and the idea in this song is that, pointing to Revelation, that the only one worthy of all praise and honor and glory is Jesus. Don't make Christianity, especially Seventh-day Adventism, about us. It's about Christ. In relationship, now as a church, we ask the Lord to lead our hearts to walk and love the way that Jesus loves and walks. The reality for us Seventh-day Adventists is that you may know the 28 fundamental beliefs and still miss Jesus. Look for Christ in your walk with the Lord. Don't you do your devotionals as a way to get into heaven. L look at your devotionals as a way to meet Jesus and to give your heart to him. John 16, 14 says that he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Here in the text, Jesus is bringing to our attention the, the role of the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit is the one that leads you to Jesus. There are some people in our church community that have now dis, uh, have brought down the role of the Holy Spirit as if the Holy Spirit is a threat to Jesus. We find that the Holy Spirit always leads us to Christ, not from him. We need to understand that the role here that Jesus is saying is that Jesus, that the Holy Spirit will lead us, will guide us to the Lord. So when we pray, we say, Lord, may your spirit lead us in our understanding of Scripture. Now, I, I want to share with you a story that really impacted me. In a classroom of 20 pastors, the question was asked, who is the most influential person in your walk with Christ, in your discipleship journey? And I was interested because I had my answer, but the rest of the pastors had their own answers. And I kid you not, about 85% of the pastors said moms. <laughs> that their moms were their biggest influential uh, person in their walk with the Lord. And that was my answer. So I don't want to give off the illusion that my relationship with my mother is perfect. We disagree all the time. <laughs> and it's interesting because I'm a parent now. And I realize that when disagreements happen between me and my children, I'm not very happy. But the reality is that disagreements doesn't mean something is wrong. So parents, if your kids disagree with you, relax. Ask the Lord to guide you and your children in whatever subject it is. Well, I was talking to my mother, and over the years, she told me something. She asked me, she said, Edgar, in the church, there's a lot of convinced people, convinced of truth. And at Seventh-day Adventist, we really hammer truth, because it's true, right? We want to follow Jesus according to Scripture, not according to our church or a pastor, but according to Scripture. But the reality is, though, that there are many who are convinced, but few that are converted, and what's the difference between someone that's convinced and someone that's converted? And I will present to you the idea that the person who's convinced knows about theology. They know about Jesus. The person who's converted is walking with Christ. So question for you this morning is, are you convinced or are you converted? Are you convinced of Bible truth or are you being converted by Jesus walking with you in your life? The real change in our lives doesn't happen when we get baptized. The real change in our life happens when we walk with Jesus on the continual basis. The enemy will try to dissuade you and try to, to, to discourage you. And even religiosity, going to church often, can make you think that you're good. But the only one that can really transform you from the inside out is Christ. So are you walking with him, or do you only know about him? Conversion happens while walking with Jesus. And I want to 
end the message by saying the written word of God matters because the Bible leads us to Christ. The Bible must not be used like a hammer. Hitting people over the head saying, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. But we must use the Bible to lead people to Christ. And the one that convicts people, the one that changes people is the Lord pointing that out in their heart. Very few times do our comments make any impact in people's lives. But it's the, it, it is Christ working in our lives that transforms us from the inside out. Our closing song today is, is thy word. Because thy word, the written word of God will lead us to Christ and may it be a light upon our lives. May we Look at scripture, not just to be biblically correct, but to look for Christ who transforms us and leads us. May we keep scripture at the center of our religious experience, and may we find Christ every day of our lives.